What's up, you rebel-minded freaks? This is where we question everything and provoke the normality of the world, all in an effort to face ourselves and become better humans. That's what it takes to be rebel-minded. You in? Let's do this. What is up, my friends? I'm Zach Henson. I am your host of the Rebel Minded Podcast, and today I want to talk about pets and their tails. Okay, we'll, we'll not talk about pets and tails, but have you ever seen all the dogs chase their tails? Have you ever wondered what that is? Like, how? what is the deal with dogs being able to completely entertain themselves <laughs> without hands to grasp without <laughs> somebody to play with uh what's the thing with you know the toys and the chasing the tails i don't know there's something that i think most other species have that we don't or we we've lost connection with you know something deeper more connected more spiritual you know <laughs> maybe maybe it has something to do with their domestication Maybe dogs in their domestication have some sort of happy happy instinct, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. I'm off track today. But have you ever noticed the beginning of a year, kind of things seem to, maybe it's within our own little world. It's just what we tend to think of. Maybe our minds see the new year coming and, and we ready ourselves for it and things start to release and things start to build motivation. We start to build motivation for and, and so on and so on. I don't know. But it seems like kind of everything that I recognize is starting to calm down or is starting to clear up. And it's almost weird how the external world does that and then we ourselves follow suit. Isn't that kind of weird? Like how the waves, our waves seem to follow the waves of everything outside of us. And sometimes I wonder if that's because we get so much information and we get so much uh, stimulation from the outside world, you know, that, that we seem to ride the same wave. But what happens when that needs to be disrupted? You know, what, what do we do when we are aware enough that it is taking away from our own being like it's taking away from our own goals like because of covid this last year how many of us thrived how many of us actually had things happen fantastically outside of the fact that the world was having such a struggle you know um i think my struggles were rough this year and I wonder if it has to do with what I saw in the external world and thinking that that somehow I was convinced that it was going to disrupt my world just a little bit of just a little bit of insight um or something to question at least right but I think things for me personally are good and I hope they're they're good for you personally um there seems to be as long as we keep thinking on things and as long as we keep questioning things, as long as we keep analyzing things, maybe not overanalyze, you know, to the point where they burn out. But the more that we do this stuff, it seems like the more we actually figure out. We battle things that we don't understand again and again and again and again until it does make sense. And it seems like the last, at least half of this last year, that's kind of what my mind was going through. And it's become more and more instinctive for me to trust my gut if that makes sense and they're one and the same I guess but I've gotten better at trusting my gut I've gotten better at realizing the stresses that I don't need I've gotten better at realizing when I need to be with friends when I need to relax when I need to make myself smile when I need to feel joy and I think that's a huge step towards something. No matter how much the struggle is, I think that that, that is a huge step when we start to listen to our, our intuition and we start to pay attention to what pleasures we are after and what goals we're after despite the reactions to us or the reactions that we think they are. 
Um, and knowing that our mind doesn't work as one, that we are something separate from the world and at the same time part of a community that does best by having us in it. It's, it's a weird coupling of two extremes that doesn't seem to make sense, but there's something real about giving everything to ourselves in order to be our best and to live our best life and to also give and be our best for the people around us to, in order to take care of the world itself and to take care of the people that live on it. Um, but I think that's kind of what I want to tap into today is, is knowing that difference. And I hope you guys are with me on this. Not with me. Like if you totally disagree, that's fine. I'm, if it makes sense to you. I hope that it makes sense to you because this last week has been a mess um, as far as I was traveling and impromptu traveling. And um, I kind of got sick this last week and, you know, I got a new iPhone, which what the hell? (laughs) Why do these things have to be? The phone's not complicated. But it's the transferring of the systems and the accounts and all that stuff that's just like, it took a real hit to my schedule. And I hope if there's any Apple owners out there listening, I I hope this is worth it, this transition, because I've never had an iPhone ever in my life. And so we'll see what this new journey brings. Maybe it brings my success. iPhone brings success. That'd be one for the books. So let's get into this without any further ado. This is episode 44, Accepting Diversity, the Damage of One Army. As my views on the world broadens, as I take in different views and experience the world from new angles, I've believed more and more that there's something not only beautiful and mysterious about it all, but largely important about the differences between us. The differences. And those differences as humans, as solitary, singular, separate humans. Our differences give us color. I said it before. They create the multidimensional world that we've created. Just as our own views of the world broaden, so should our acceptance of what makes us different. And there are two clashing ideas here. It seems that in our biological psychology, we find comfort and we find confidence in being a part of something, being in a tribe, being part of something niche. From what I can see, we seem to fall in love with being a part of more and more detailed positions inside of a party. It makes us feel unique within that party. And I'll try to tell you what I mean. If you're a writer, like a deeply passionate writer, like an author or a blogger or a poet or a screenwriter. You soak up that material from other writers. You relate to them and you understand them, just as they probably relate and understand you, even in your differences in your writing styles and what you write about and what you create. You bond with the fact that they are part of the same world that other non-writers understand. It's some mutual magnetic respect. And in doing so, you feel more comfortable and confident in that space. You want to be around them. You want to speak to them, collaborate with them, inspire them, and be inspired. You want to make yourself better because of them. Even in your differences, you find a respect and can acknowledge their point of view more than you can someone who lives outside of that world. It seems we are attracted and they're more trustworthy of the people that understand us. And we create a bias and a distrust to those that are different than us. Now, I'm not trying to polarize and I'm not trying to objectify anybody outside of your world. I'm trying to make a point. We are constantly comparing ourselves to others. It's kind of an inevitable, necessary process as it's put by Jordan Harbinger in his article that I read. Why you compare yourself to others. At least, that was my interpretation of it. And you know what? I can definitely understand his point of view. 
It seems so many influencers and successes nowadays are telling us what we quote unquote should and shouldn't do in order to be a success. But does that really make sense? In a logistics position, it might, and whatever eliminations and additions you make to your life may or may not truly help you. The only point I'm trying to make is that it's far more complex than that. To follow everything to a, to a T and expect that that's going to get you to where you want to go. It doesn't work the same for everyone. Just like Forrest's box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get. But this time, it depends on your taste. Everyone likes different chocolate. And some people don't like it at all. And these people are called Satanists. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but, but I'm getting way the fuck off track here. My point was to take our differences into consideration. And us know that they exist. And know that there is one crucial fact when it comes to how we handle each other in this interactive world. Differences are not what makes right and wrong. Our differences shouldn't be what separate us. They should and are what make us great. I'm not saying to be friends with everyone. There are characteristics to all of us that make us incompatible. Our spoken differences, the ones we face our fears in saying, are what truly bring respect and understanding to each other. Because there's something dangerous happening on the other end of this spectrum. Where everyone agrees. Where everyone is the same thing. My head is always wrapped up in some book. I have from my opinion, a short attention span for most books, but some I just keep pushing myself through. I've built a small library of things that matter to me personally, the things that make sense to me, the things that make me curious, the things that are, I'm super inquisitive about, the things that I don't understand, things that make sense in the miniature world that I live in. And one of those this last year was a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, recommended to me by a friend, actually, and it's been disruptive and impressive and amazing and kind of scary. This book rolled me over and literally scared the shit out of me. And not because that's what its intention was, but because it disrupted the safe feeling and trustworthiness of this world that I've always lived in. There's something about large populations that does two major things from my point of view. It creates major amounts of diversity. It brings in more imagination more challenge, more perspective, and more power for real change. But it also seems to bring in more hostility and violence. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm reading this wrong. Maybe it's just majoritive and there's more to the psychology of large communities and groups of people than I can yet understand. Who knows? But this book, written by two collaborating authors by the name of Lukianoff, a First Amendment expert, and hate, a social psychologist, speaks on the most recent generations and the connection between the violence and disruptions that have been happening at colleges and universities. As I read through this book, I started to see a darkness among people that I never expected. I saw the potential for evil in people that I expected to be forward thinkers, educated, and to my assumption, more accepting, very liberal. But I was so very wrong, and not in the way that I expected. Being progressive and educated doesn't count for shit when it comes to being passionate and accepting of the humans that stand next to you. It's easy to get wrapped up in impulses that trigger us and justify our actions. Now, not to give away the whole of the book, because I'd love for you guys to read it, but to make an acknowledgement, Lukianoff and Haidt talk about the three great untruths that have taken over the minds of many today. Three things. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Always trust your feelings. And life is a battle between good people and bad people. Now think on those. Do they make sense? Can you connect with them now? Or do they seem disruptive to the system? Now you're going to have to read this book to dive deeper. So I don't want to take this too far out of context. And I'll try to explain this a little bit. But I will give you some bullet points here. And the way it is affecting us. And the attention of this rebel-minded episode. The problem most of these youths are having is that there seems to be a huge new perspective that we have the right to stop violence from happening to us, which, yeah, we do. But there has been a redefining of violence that includes verbal violence, which is a real thing, right? Yes, but the line that has been blurred is whatever things that are spoken in our freedom of speech that actually are contradictive or challenging to our own perspectives and ideas are being considered violent. Therefore, meaning that if you are subject to listening to it, 
then it is unruly violence on your ears and that it is hurting you. And if it's hurting you, then it will take a toll on your life. You are then being subject to irreparable trauma. Secondly, there has been a definite change in how younger generations are reacting to the world. There has been an untraceable, to me anyway, education that whatever we instinctively feel, we must trust. But to me, this seems to be another blurred line between intuition and gut feeling and emotions being triggered by the world we call our home. It seems that anything that disrupts our peace must obviously be stopped. That if we feel threatened or intimidated or suppressed by the uncontrollable opinions of others, that it must be justifiably silenced because it has triggered our own emotions. Does nobody remember the term of sticks and stones? But where does the self-processing come into play here? When do we stop ourselves from reacting and considering that our trusted feelings may be the amplification of our own traumas or negative experiences? How is it that the respect we have for other people's opinions goes down the toilet when it goes against our own belief? Is that part of the First Amendment? Does that have anything to do with freedom of speech? Does that go against the freedom of speech? And lastly, which seems to be the most disturbing to me, is that there is a huge separation between parties. And I don't just mean political parties or lifestyles. I mean this polarization between people. We are separating ourselves in how we think and feel. We are finding more reason to unanimously decide what is right and wrong. And everything that is done against us has become the enemy, has become the evil. And therefore, as I said in the beginning of the episode, we are becoming indifferent, even biased and spiteful against the other extreme. And the more we disassociate with the opposite of our own, the more we objectify and therefore can justify the violence we have against that opposite extreme, or anybody within the spectrum, even. Think of it like this. Say that you grow up in a world where you know religion. Your family itself isn't religious, so you have an outside neutral perspective as you start to see things lay themselves out in the world. You see the point of view from dedicated Christians and Judaism and even Buddhism. You can also see the point of the atheist, the scientific, and the evolution. You see the spectrum, and you can create your own filter built with the multiple perspectives that you've come across in your own world. Then, you yourself have a near-death experience. You see the tunnel, the white light, the silhouetted figure, and you clearly decide that God is real and you fully commit to being a Christian. Does that then mean that you get to disown all other ideas of what exists? of what other truths people may have. From my experience, no. I think it's impossible to disown what other people believe even after a first-hand experience. But imagine only having one point of view. Imagine growing up in an extreme point of view. Imagine being told that everyone else is wrong. Imagine living a life dedicated to something that you were taught, but not necessarily experienced. See, to me, Experience never includes just your own. It includes also seeing and listening to experiences. It means uncomfortably setting yourself beyond your own perspective in order to be sure of your position. And that's what I think creates wisdom. Experience is to wisdom as education is to knowledge. And to me, they are definitely not one and the same. If you can have a detailed, clear vision of what life is supposed to be, who created us, why we're here. How is it that one out of eight billion people, you get to decide that what you say is true and dismantle everybody else's beliefs? To come full circle, the danger that I see floats around a new disruption in the mindsets being created. To keep safe our young, whether physical, emotional, or mental, we keep them from experience. Because of our own traumas and challenges, we are bubbling up our youth. And at first, I thought that that meant there would be just oversensitivity, which it has. I think I myself was too greatly protected of my own feelings that I grew into an adulthood without any resilience to personal and interpersonal challenges. And without that challenge, it was years before I started to feel confident around women to not be intimidated around other men and to face the challenge of asking for what I want in life. I always live small. And I'm just now repairing the damage. But now there has been an addition to that formula. The up and coming are being told that they can have whatever they want. 
and that they can be absolutely anything that they want to be, which is amazingly true, actually, but it's only surface level. Don't get me wrong. A limitless mind is a powerful one. We can accomplish things with it that we've only dreamed of. But when that goes hand in hand with lack of perspective and lack of challenge and lack of understanding the importance of failure and experience, it then becomes what I call an entitlement complex. And within that entitlement, plus the extremist's mindset, the unexpected is starting to happen. People are redefining the world in order to accommodate themselves, their emotions, their points of view. Indifference is leading to objectification, which is leading to aggression, which is leading to violence against someone that is just as human as yourself. When we believe something, we feel more comfortable with the ones that also believe what we do. We join an army where we feel power. We feel the strength to change the world. We find that bound together, we can make moves we never could on our own. We are definitely meant to have our groups, our cultures, our little tribes. But they were never meant to absolve the tribes outside of us. The only way to create one army is to be violent. To silence the others, we have to destroy. Think Hitler and Stalin and Hussein and Vlad the Impaler. I just add that one because it sounds awesome. I don't know much about Vlad. But yes, <laughs> I had to Google these men because my history sucks. My memory of history is absolutely blank when it comes to reference, um, except for Hitler. Uh, everyone knows that guy. But all of these men all had a mind that was desolate of any other perspective outside of their own. Singular thinking leads to a potential, quote-unquote, cleansing of the rest. I hope whatever you've gained from this episode is something more broad than when you came in. There are things that I deeply believe that are necessary for our survival. And diversity, in my opinion, is the most underrated value that is being more and more overlooked. We are meant to be different. And let me be clear. I don't mean separate. I mean different. There is no learning without diversity. There is no challenge without diversity. There is no growth without diversity. And there is no peace without it either. The world thrives off of balance. And without it, we tip too deeply into potential destruction. The world is always experiencing new challenges, challenges that will always take time to assess and real work to overcome. I don't have the answers to what it takes to overcome this challenge. What I do have is the idea of what we could be. What I do have is faith in our intelligence and our capacity for love. Because these together are the only reason why we exist. Without them, we would perish. We would have long ago. So here's my set of questions for you. Are you pushing yourself through challenge? Are you building a resilience to the world outside of yourself? Can you be understanding of the outside point of view? Can you believe in other people's beliefs? And can you love others who see the world differently than you do? Diversity from every angle is more important than we realize. Probably now more than ever. And if this episode made a difference to you, if it helped you or infuriated you, get back to me. Let me know. Because that's diversity. That's challenge. And that's where we learn respect for each other. And we grow together. <sighs> Keep questioning, guys. Stay robo minded This is Zach, your host here on the RMP. I love you, my peeps. I'm out. All right, guys. If you're here, then you have some sort of connection or curiosity of what goes on. So from the bottom of my little hamster heart, thank you. Even through a mic, that's what we call connection. And my life always gets better and more clear with all the souls that I get to connect with. If you like what you're hearing, or you want to share your story with me and the podcast, which I would absolutely love, write in. Send me an email or send me a text. You can contact me through IG as Creed Soldier or email me at Zachary at ChaosCreed.com. That's Z-A-C-K-A-R-Y at K-H-A-O-S-K-R-E-E-D dot com. And of course, if you're up to the challenge and curious about really speeding up your self-development and your potential and getting committed to bettering yourself, send me a notification with Getting Rebel Minded in the title. Even if all you need is that confidential space to talk, I'm here to give that to you. Share, like, and follow the podcast if it means something to you. Then you'll know when every new episode and interview has been published. I've always got more good things coming.